Extra Historians, welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we tell you all the stuff we got wrong, the things we left out, and all of the World War I era Royal Navy vessels that we very helpfully updated to modern ones, just so they could do a little better at the Battle of Jutland, feel like they need a little push. Uh, this is Rob, I'm the head writer of Extra History, and this is our series on the Easter Rising. Uh, though I didn't write this specific one, we'll get into that later. First of all, I wanted to say thank you for joining us, uh, especially if you are a patron. Lies is made possible by our Patreon patrons. And this is a really important part of the show, not just to correct the record on things we get wrong, because we will, uh, but also to show that history is a conversation and there are different interpretations of, of things. And uh, we always want to engage with our community and, and talk about the, the, how you felt uh, about our episodes and how you might have a different spin on these ideas than we did. Because that's history, right? Is interpreting and reinterpreting and various different takes on the same uh, on the same material. So thank you for helping make extra history possible and helping it make it a little more like an actual uh, historical conversation. Recommended reading for this series is The Easter Rising by Michael Foy, Dublin's Great Wars, The First World War, The Easter Rising and the Irish Revolution by Richard S. Grayson, Easter Rising 1916, Birth of the Irish Republic by Michael McNally. Uh, I did want to mention that we're a partner with Nebula, uh, where you can see ad-free videos of our shows, plus some exclusives, and also other friends of the show like Legal Eagle. Nebula is a creator-owned and built network, so we are able to do some cool stuff there we're not able to do on YouTube. It's a big, big uh, help to sign up there. And also they have a special deal that if you sign up for Curiosity Stream, you also get Nebula. It's a, it's a fantastic deal. They've got such great, uh, great, great documentary stuff there, and it's a really low price for a yearly subscription. Um, so thank you very much if you check that out. Uh, just a few general comments. We had a guest writer for this series, uh, Dr. Robbie McNiven. Robbie is, uh, did a great job uh, for this trial by fire first guest series. You'll have also, also seen his Battle of Culloden episode. He has another one-off uh, coming as well. Uh, Robbie has written some books for Marvel. He did a, an X-Men novel first team for Descent and for uh, Black Library, Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000, which is how I uh, came into contact with him. He's a specialist in 18th century warfare, particularly uh, for the British Army. And he wrote some books for Osprey, which if you have watched Lies, you know that we frequently cite Osprey books. Uh, he has two, two out Battle Tactics of the American Revolution and British Light Infantry in the American Revolution. He's a, he's a very, very smart about this. You should definitely uh, check him out. Uh, and he did an amazing job with this series. Uh, our artist, Nick DeWitt, also did just an incredible knocked it out of the park for this one. He's, Nick is amazing in how he can uh, get animated characters to emote, and he really, really uh, engaged all of his skills with this series. Um, I did want to make a very, like, kind of general contextual comment um, about this series, which is from the British perspective, this is all happening right before the Battle of the Somme. So they are building up to the Somme in 1916. This is the first really big mass deployment of British forces in France. So this is a big deal for them. This is a huge undertaking that they are already planning for. And like six weeks before that happened, the Easter Rising. So uh, that's, they're kind of like, this is a very bad timing for the British. Episode one, a uh, patron question from Hercules. You mentioned in episode one that uh, it would be a six years from 1916 that Ireland would become a republic, except that's incorrect. Following the war for independence and the Civil War, uh, yeah, the British king and head of state, it wouldn't be until 1937 that they would actually become a republic. Yes, this is correct. There's more to this comment that I will get to later when we talk about episode five. Uh, but yes, we shouldn't have called Ireland a republic in 1922. It is much more complicated. They are on that road, but that's not certain at that point. Um, it gets messy. A uh, YouTube question. Dublin is an amazing city to visit. It's so eerie to walk through where the writhing happened and see the bullet holes. It's chilling and exhilarating. Yeah, I, uh, Dublin is high on the list of places I want to get to. I'm very much looking forward to some future date when I get to travel there now that we can actually start to travel again. No more 21 days quarantine with both of my children who are both under four. Uh, another person mentioned Roger Caseman is well known in Peru. He stood up for the rights of indigenous people being exploited in the Peruvian rainforest. 
uh, by evil land landowners. In fact, he's the main character in the historical novel El Sueño del, Ke uh, del Kelta by Peruvian novelist Mario Vargas Llosa. It's worth pointing out that the said no this said novel came out just a few days before Mario was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, and to this day, he's the only Peruvian to have won said prize. That's really cool. Um, we'll talk about in our Ibn Batuta side trip, a lot of these British uh, Foreign Service employees have this very interesting global, uh, these global legacies uh, that, you know, they kind of are in one place for four years and they do something that really changes that place. And then they go to another place for four years and they uh, end up doing the same thing. Episode two, YouTube question. I wish you had mentioned that Colony was a trade union leader and the majority of the ICA remembers the transport union. And that was basically the soul of the uprising. They did rise up underneath the banner. We serve neither King nor Kaiser. Uh, yes, this was absolutely part of the rising. We did mention that he was a socialist, but we didn't get so into all these uh, connections of the, the transport unions and trade unions. Uh, yeah, there, there were a lot of things that we couldn't get into. We'll talk about boiling a series down to five episodes while talking about the legacies of the rising, but also having enough detail to collect work in the drama is a very difficult thing. It's the most difficult thing when we write an, uh, a history series. And um, that's why we have lies partly to put in like, hey, here's an aspect we just did not discuss. Another commenter said, I'd like to mention that Thomas Francis Meagher was a leader in the 1848 Young Irelander Rebellion. He escaped a British prison in Australia and went on to become a hero in the American Civil War and later governor of Montana. Yes, I have been circling the idea of a uh, one-off episode on Thomas Meagher for quite a while. And the reason for that is he appears not by name, in our Irish Potato Famine series, because we talk about the 1848 Young Irelander Rebellion, and we mention some of the leaders get scooped up and sent uh, to faraway prison colonies. He goes to Van Diemen's Land, actually, not, not Australia, which it's Tasmania, it's around Australia. Um, but uh, we mentioned him, but not by name, and Meagher went on to go to New York, uh, to the Irish community there, he becomes a brigadier general in the American Civil War. He recruits, trains, and leads the famous 69th New York Infantry Regiment, known as the Irish Brigade. This is one of the most famous uh, units in the Union Army uh, throughout the Civil War. He fights at Antietam, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville. The Irish, uh, Irish Brigade takes absolutely horrible casualties uh, at the Battle of Fredericksburg. That's kind of their most famous, uh, famous moment. And there's a point where they, they are fighting another Irish unit on the Confederate side, which is really sad. Um, and then he becomes governor in Montana and is maybe murdered by political opponents. There's a very sketchy thing where he falls off a boat into a water into the water and drowns. Um, so I would, yes, I would love to go into him for a full episode. Someone wanted to note that the leader of the IR, IRB in Ireland is called Padraig Pierce rather than Patrick Pierce. This is the Gaelic name rather than the, the anglicized name. Yes, that's correct. We went with the anglicized name. In general, we try and keep the number of proper nouns down in, um, in our series because it makes it more comprehensible for a short video. And also, sometimes we go with anglicized names because partially just to, to we're, we won't always nail the pronunciation every time uh, sometimes, but also it makes it a little more comprehensible for a global audience. But this is a good thing to mention in a live video. Uh, so thank you for bringing it up. So we did mention it. Uh, why did you guys use the Sheffield class guided missile destroyer and not an era accurate L or M class? We were just trying to throw the naval war, you know, in, uh, in, in, we we're just trying to throw a little support uh, into, uh, into the first world war. We thought a guided missile destroyer or a guided missile destroyer would be something that really is necessary back then. Um, and so smart people like you could notice and point it out. The hardest things are maps, flags, and we don't usually mention this, but ships, firearms, and trains. Um, it's a kind of thing that is, is difficult for an artist often to figure out what to use, and then it'll slip by in, in, um, in uh, review. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure why we didn't catch that, but we didn't. Uh, episode three. YouTube question, why were scarce resources during the rising allocated to a biscuit factory in a hotel? Isn't a railway station, port, or phone exchange a higher priority target? I don't mean this in any way to 
devalue or denigrate the rebels, I'm sure there's a good explanation. Uh, I'd be grateful just for someone to share the historical context for this choice. Yeah, occupying the areas, remember they, they called for a rebellion, but then there was a counter order, so they had fewer, less manpower than they expected. And then there wasn't this popular rising that they expected. Um, occupying the ports would have just spread them too thin. They didn't have the manpower for it. Um, but the biscuit factory was in a really good strategic area. So it wasn't about like what that building produced. It was about just the area of the city it was in. And also they were just grabbing buildings that were really well built. So like the, the post office had those very thick, thick walls too. So that made it a really good uh, center. And I think the same was for the biscuit factory. Just it was very solidly built. So it was good to withstand gunfire. And efforts were made to cut rail and communication lines, but it just wasn't successful. We mentioned how the uh, communication lines were reestablished, uh, the post office employees patched them, and then also they briefly had the railroad station, but then were repulsed. Uh, this is very similar, actually. I'm working on a series about John Brown. It's very similar to his raid on Harper's Ferry, where he just doesn't have the manpower to properly secure all the things he, he could secure, and that includes the rail lines. So I mentioned, funnily enough, during the fighting at St. Stephen's Green uh, was the only truce of the Rising uh, that was declared. It was a daily ceasefire each day at midday so the groundskeeper could come in and feed the ducks. We didn't hear about this story. Uh, it might not be true, but if it is true, it's amazing. And if it isn't true, it's amazing too, uh, because sometimes historical myths are just fun, even if they're, even if they're not true. And we can point out that, that that might not be true, but it's a great story anyway. And stories like that, you know, they... They give you the flavor of the time and what people would like to think happened, even if it's yeah, even if it's not true. We have no idea with this one. Maybe you could tell us in the comments uh, if it's true or not. As an Irishman, thank you for highlighting that a biscuit factory was a central hub for the political birth of my nation. Well, you put it in such a good location, which nice thick walls. So really, thank you. Um, and someone said, I was in Dublin last month, and you can still see the bullet holes in the columns of the post office. Uh, Robbie said that he read this was a myth and those aren't originals, but he might be wrong. So um, we have a, a bunch of those in Hong Kong, actually. We have a bunch of damage from World War II that you can still see. Um, and uh, certain places, I think in our Angkor Wat series, we also mentioned that there, there are bullet holes in Angkor Wat that are still there um, from the, uh, the war with Vietnam in the 1970s. Um, and I saw that when I was there, and I think that's... That's true. Episode four, YouTube question. I wish you had mentioned Elizabeth Farrell, the woman who carried the surrender to the British. Uh, she was cropped out of the photo of the surrender. Uh, also a nod to Margaret Skinner, who fought in the rising and was wounded and the fighting would be nice too, otherwise a solid episode. We made sure that our, uh, we showed women fighting as part of the uh, revolutionary forces. But we didn't, yeah, we didn't mention them by name. Uh, yeah, this is, a very interesting story, especially why she was cropped out, we don't know. Uh, there are a number of competing theories as to why she was removed, but there's no hard evidence for anyone specifically. Um, and we didn't have enough time to get into that in the series. But yeah, we probably should have mentioned her or at least shown her visually and put up a name. Um, but word space was at a premium at that point. Um, so yeah, I apologize. One of the things of note in that this is the post office was where the census records and archives were and all that was lost during the uprising. So unless you have oral genealogy, there are a lot of family line, family trees that don't extend past 1916 because all these records were destroyed. And Robbie said this was correct. And actually, this is especially sad for him as someone who studies the uh, British military in the 18th century because so many records uh, that dealt with that time were just completely lost. And, you know, so much of the British army was Irish at that time. Uh, so it really closed off a lot of areas for research, and it was very tragic uh, for historians like him. Episode 5, patron question from Hercules. We're actually going to do a number of these questions, so we're going to kind of build out our answer to this. In Episode 5, you mentioned that the Irish Civil War was fought between those that wanted to keep Ireland part of the British Empire and those that wanted Ireland to be out of the Commonwealth. That's not really true. The Civil War was over the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which granted autonomy to Ireland, but they had to swear loyalty to the British king. The sides were pro-treaty and anti-treaty, not pro-British and anti-British. Michael Collins, who was a major leader in the Free State, described it as the freedom to achieve freedom. Uh, it was pro-treaty. The idea that would be to use this autonomy from the treaty to work towards a greater freedom for Ireland over time. 
uh, ironically, something that uh, Iman de Valera would do when he came to power despite fighting against Collins on the side of the anti-treaty forces. We'll address this in some later questions as well, but to keep it in short, while the leadership and soldiers of the pro-treaty movement were as Republican as the anti-treaty ones, it was a how we achieve a, a republic rather than uh, whether we want to achieve one, uh, they had a big tent movement and they by necessity also had the backing of unionists and moderates. And so it's not wholly inaccurate actually to describe them as ultimately uh, keeping Ireland within Britain's sphere of influence. There was some disagreement even with the, in their own pro-treaty side about what the, the ultimate purpose of this treaty was supposed to do. Um, but yes, we oversimplified it to the point of creating uh, an inaccuracy. Uh, patron question from Red Wizrobe. Hi, I recently joined the EC Patreon and I have to know what the heck kind of statute, this is the death statute, allows the death sentence to be determined of whether where a uh, comma was placed. This is from uh, episode five when we talk about how Casement was, quote, hanged on a comma. So the Treason Act of 1351 appeared only to, uh, appear, appeared to apply only to activities carried out on British soil. Casement argued because he had been doing all of his plotting in Germany and the US, he wasn't on British soil at the time, therefore the Treason Act could not apply to him. Basically, if you remember, the U-boat dumps him on shore and he's got malaria and he's immediately picked up. So he doesn't really do anything treasonous on Irish soil. The court decided that a comma in the act should be read in the unpunctuated original Norman French medieval text, which changed the meaning of in the realm or elsewhere to refer to anywhere where treasonous activity was carried out. And that's why he was hanged. And this becomes part of the kind of like feeling that this trial is not fair and that these guys are being railroaded. Um, so this, is a, this becomes one of the things that turns people against the British government in Ireland, uh, because it's clear that they have an outcome that they want and they are interpreting the statutes to get, statutes to get that outcome. Uh, YouTube comment, Joseph Plunkett got married just before his execution, which helped turn anger against the British. Yeah, again, this is all this stuff that is happening where um, after the rising, which is throwing the rising in a different light. This is very, very common with quote unquote failed uh, uprisings that, yeah, the uprising itself fails, but the way people come to see it because of how things are handled afterwards means that people are more sympathetic to the rebels afterward. We're going to see this with John Brown very much, where when he makes the raid on Harper's Ferry immediately afterward, he's not that popular. People are very shocked. But the things that he is able to say at his trial and to media afterward, and the way that the state of Virginia clearly just throws the book at him, so he's definitely executed in a pretty nasty way, uh, turns people, many people in the North, uh, pro John Brown when they hadn't been before. It's a shame you didn't touch on how Ireland became split between North and South. It's one of the more relevant parts of this whole ordeal in the modern day. This would fall beyond our scope into a War of Independence Civil War series, which we may do in the future. Um, yeah, I agree, but that's something that isn't quite dealt with to the point where, where we, we had to end it somewhere, basically. After the War of Independence, Ireland won concessions from London. This war wasn't won, it was a stalemate. Sinn Féin got con concessions, a treaty to end the war, 26 counties uh, where the Irish free, free State would be ruled from Dublin, while the North, six counties, and three ports would remain part of Britain. The treaty wasn't overly accepted by Ireland and its people, with, where more wanted to keep fighting to win all 32 counties, but Ireland just couldn't keep fighting, it was exhausted. Uh, Ireland was split to, into pro-treaty and anti-treaty movements, where the pro-treaty side uh, of the House in Ireland's new parliament won by a small majority, um, and the treaty was signed. Sinn Féin split, and it resulted in the Irish Civil War. Similar comment, framing the civil wars between Republicans and those who wanted to stay in the empire isn't the whole story. Uh, it was between those who wanted to make peace with the Anglo-Irish Irish Treaty and those who wanted to keep fighting for a full republic. Uh, Pro-treaty forces had majority support and there wasn't really much fight left in the IRA. Not many people actually wanted to be a dominion and give up the six counties that were to remain part of Britain, but the treaty was a compromise, which I think is worth a mention. Yeah, it's correct that Michael Collins and the vast majority of both the leadership and rank and file of the active pro-treaty movement were Republicans and saw the treaty as a stepping stone to an independent Irish Republic. However, by necessity, they were also on the side of these moderates and unionists that were within their um, faction. And um, the strength of the desire to not break all ties to Britain is spelled out by the fact that 
the constitutional change didn't occur until 1937, and the creation of a full republic received 56.5% of votes. And those votes were only from 38.6% of the eligible voting population. So there are many shades of gray in this, but we'd absolutely agree that we oversimplified, and um, well, it's one of the reasons that we have a lies. Uh, that's it for the Easter Rising coming up on Extra History. Next time, the path to Pearl Harbor, oh, is someone who was born in Hawaii and has lived my whole, basically my whole life in the Asia Pacific on battlefields of the Pacific War. I'm so excited to get into the very long chain of events that leads to the attack of, on Pearl Harbor, uh, including things like the bombing of the USS Panay in the 1930s um, during the, the Rape of Nanking that is, I didn't even know about, right? That a US ship is sunk <laughs> during during this period and it becomes a huge diplomatic incident. Uh, and we're gonna get into US intercepts of Japanese diplomatic cables and all sorts of cool stuff. Frederick the Great, uh, after that, he's a fascinating historical character who essentially creates what we think of as Prussia. He's a great military leader, but perhaps too headstrong of, of one. Uh, he's gay, we'll get into that. Uh, there's all sorts of amazing things. He has a giant porcelain connect collection and is just living in a big pink palace with a bunch of greyhounds. Interesting guy. Um, then John Brown, who I've talked about a little bit, one of the most prominent abolitionists, uh, American abolitionists, and clear, very specifically the one who really thinks uh, that slavery will not be done away with peacefully. And he believes that violence is a legitimate tool uh, in the fight against slavery, and he will perpetuate massacres, and he will try and create a large-scale slave uprising where he seizes a federal arsenal and tries to arm people that are supposed to flock to his banner. It doesn't really happen. Um, the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, we are now collecting topics for our Napoleonic Wars vote. We're probably going to do things like Nelson, uh, Lord Thomas Cochrane, who is a fascinating guy, uh, we might do something like Napoleon's Escape from Elba. Um, so that's going to be a really fun series. Join our Patreon. You can suggest uh, suggest topics and then vote on those topics. You can help shape the future of our series. Ibn Battuta's side trip. I am actually taking you to where I live in Hong Kong. So let's connect the Easter Rising to Hong Kong. So if you remember at the beginning of episode one, there's this uh, official that happens to be working at Dublin Castle, and he ends up running and closing the gate to the rebels, and that's why they don't end up taking storming Dublin Castle. That is Sir Matthew Nathan, Undersecretary for Ireland. He would actually get blamed and end up resigning because he didn't do enough to stop the rising. Um, this wasn't his first post as a, in Foreign Service. He was the governor of the Gold Coast of Natal, but, but between 1904 and 1907, he was the 13th governor of Hong Kong. And his biggest impact on the city was building this wide two-mile road across this very marshy area of the Kowloon Peninsula, running from the harbor into the heart of uh, Kowloon. This would be called Nathan's Folly during his uh, tenure because it's this marshy, it was very difficult to construct, but uh, it ended up becoming the major commercial road in Kowloon, later renamed Nathan Road in his honor. If you've been to Hong Kong, you have been to Nathan Road. And if you've not been to Hong Kong, you know exactly what it looks like. Because if you imagine a street in Hong Kong, you're gonna imagine a street with all this neon, like almost crossing over in the middle, that's Nathan Road. And it's a huge commercial uh, commercial uh, area. The Peninsula Hotel is there, Chungking Mansions, if you've seen Chungking Express, that's there. Uh, and even like the, the Doctor Strange film, the like last final fight scene, that very much looks like the Mongkok areas of Nathan Road. It's essentially where it's supposed to take place. Uh, there's also one of the prominent Jewish members of the British Foreign Service at that time, which is cool. Uh, so yeah, that's how we that's how we get from modern Hong Kong to uh, a guy participating in the Easter Rising. Thank you so much. I really hope you join us for the Path to Pearl Harbor. See you next time. Well, shucks, howdy there, Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, and Skylar Holmes. Thanks so much for being legendary patrons. 